Mentello, it is Rick Craig, you're the prophet. How are you, sir? Good. How are you guys doing? What's going on? So quick question for you to start off, Mentello, is how what made you decide to get into into the wrestling business to begin with? You know, um when I was in high school I was on uh I was on the high school basketball team, uh grade eleven starter, and then when grade twelve came around, uh I got positioned on the bench uh as a sixth man. And I wasn't really interested in, in sitting on the bench and you know, I had to talk with the coach about getting more playing time and stuff like that and uh you know, he was very much a coach that played favorites and such. And uh, I just didn't want to spend my last year sitting on the bench. So I quit the team, and I was deciding whether to take up either kickboxing or, or pro wrestling. And, uh, you know, my brother and I, as as kids, we always used to wrestle around and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, people would always be like, what you guys are doing looks like just like on TV and stuff like that. So I thought, well, you know what, why not give wrestling a try? So when you when you were a younger Montalo, did you have certain guys that you followed? I mean, for those who don't know, you're from Canada. I yes, mean, were sir. you a big big heart fan or you know things like that? I mean, I guess who got you inspired? I mean, when you were watching wrestling back in the day, you know, was it the Hearts and the Benoits and people like that of the world that got you going, or was it just others? You know what? To be to be honest with you, unlike probably most of Canada, I I wasn't a heart fan. I wasn't a Stampede Wrestling fan um, because I grew up in, in, like, the middle of Canada. Our big thing was probably AWA and then WWF. So, I mean, we would get Stampede. We would get, like I said, we would get AWA. We would get WWF. We got IWA out of Montreal. Uh, sometimes we would get NWA, depending. Like, um, the promoter here, Tony Candelo, would work in uh, work together with the NWA. So sometimes he would get certain TVs, whether it was UWF or NWA, but uh, I would say, like, mainly my, my influences growing up were WWF, and, uh, you know, probably wrestlers I liked, you know, obviously British Bulldogs were, were pretty big, and, uh, you know, Rick Martel, Paul Orndorff, my brother really liked Hogan, I was an Andre fan, I kind of cheered against whoever whoever was going against Hogan kind of thing. <laughs> you are right there with me. <laughs> Absolutely. So how'd you get going? I mean, once you got started in the business, how did you, uh, I guess, where did you get trained? Uh, what did you do as far as getting into your first promotion? Well, um, I was walking through one of the malls, and I noticed a poster for live professional wrestling. And at the bottom it said, you know, if you want to get involved in any capacity, to call Vance Nevada, who turned out to be my original trainer. So at that time, I asked my girlfriend, this was February 1997, you know, for Valentine's Day, if it would be okay if we went and watched wrestling. And uh, we went, and I checked out the card, and then after the matches, I spoke with Vance, and that Sunday, I started my first training session. How difficult was your first session? Or were you in the uh, puking mode like a lot of other people say they were after a first day in, in a wrestling training center? Uh, no, because a couple of reasons, like the training here, it wasn't, it wasn't like lucha based. So there wasn't a lot of say like running and running up and down stairs. And it wasn't, it wasn't like Japanese based where you're doing like thousands of squats and stuff like that. Right. But the one, the one issue I probably faced was that coming out of high school, I was maybe 140, 150 pounds. So learning to to bump properly you know very much took its toll on my body now with your career you have managed to go to other uh, nations across the globe you've spent some time in japan you spent some time in mexico obviously the vast majority of your career in, in the, you know the great northwest um in your opinion what's the difference between the styles that you've encountered i know you've you can wrestle various different styles, but what's the biggest differences you've noticed, you know, from going from these countries to countries? Um, I would say that the biggest difference, and and it may not be as big a difference in, in Mexico and Japan, but in comparison to North America, maybe athleticism. I think that North America, because it's more it's more entertainment based. Uh, someone who isn't as, as athletic as the next guy can kind of get in. And, um, I think in, in other countries, 
you have to, you know, you have to be able to go. And even guys who are larger or who may not have the cookie cutter body shape, you know, are still very athletic. And, and you know, you kind of have to be doing those styles. Now, do you have a preference? I mean, like I said, you've you've got to experience all these different styles. Is there a particular preference you enjoy more? Uh, you know what? Not really. Um, if 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 I had to pick one, I would say probably the Japanese style. But you know, j- like in Japan, it's so much of a mix of lucha libre. You know, they're they're very much getting into the entertainment style. So you know, things are. It, they're not as black and white as they used to be, say, in the 80s or the 90s. Um, so if I say the uh, the name Marvin Flum, do you know <laughs> what I'm getting at with that? Yeah, I do. Uh, you know, and I just found out recently that he's still alive. However, my old, old Marvel Universe books, like this must be the 80s, have him as deceased. So I don't know how he made this comeback. <laughs> so so how did, how did you get the name Mentello then? You know what? Um, when I like working in this area, obviously because of my style, skin color, stuff like that, promoters always wanted to bill me as being Mexican, <laughs> and uh, and you know I just figured, well, you know what? I may as well just try to embrace it. And you know, promoters were giving me names, and, and I just I wasn't I wasn't liking it. It wasn't anything that was really that I felt you know could make a brand for myself. And so, you know, going through comics and, you know, the old Marvel Universe books, and I, when I said the name, I just thought, well, you know, it has, like, a Mexican sort of sound to it. You know, I'm going to use this. Plus, he's dead. He doesn't need his name anymore. So I took it from him. <laughs> Rock on. Which, which <laughs> leads into my next question. Have you worn Mantello a mask your entire career? There's probably, I want to say, maybe five matches or less that I didn't wear a mask for. Um, so, so what made you want to put on the hood? You know what my decision for that came from? I didn't want to be stereotyped into having to come out with a ghetto blaster or maybe having to do break dancing or having to be a drug dealer or something like that. I wanted fans to watch me and watch my wrestling and, and appreciate me for that without like promoters trying to put their spin on it or trying to give me some kind of gimmick that I wasn't comfortable with doing. That's awesome, Mentello. Yeah, that's yes, really cool. Now, you're a lighter weight wrestler. Do you see yourself, especially when you go into, you know, you know, like a Mexico or a Japan, mixing it up with in lightweight divisions and things like that? Is that primarily what you shoot for, or what? What is your goal? Um, you know what? To be honest with you, like, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sort of in, like almost like I'm not I'm not quite a heavy. I guess if we had mid heavyweights, I would be bordering on that. Right, but um, you know, I, I do appreciate the junior heavyweight style, but it seems like in wrestling, for people to kind of, like for everyone to kind of take you seriously, you almost have to fight against heavyweights. But to be honest, like I, I appreciate the junior heavyweight style more, and you know, I have no problem being a junior heavyweight. So you made the news not too long ago about uh, reporting about a tryout. Hang on, whoa, 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 Zane. Oh, Zane, okay. Zane. <laughs> then on. Without getting into that stuff, like let me just say that, like. What I said there was sort of uh, blown out of proportion and kind of taken out of context. What I was trying to get at is that people should try to offer you positive encouragement. Like, if we're doing something and I see you not doing it correctly or I think that there's a better way for you to do it, I can't just say to you guys, like, hey, you're not doing that right. I have to say, I, I don't think you're doing it right, but... Here's here's what I the way I think you should be able to do it, or this is this is the way I think it should be done, to kind of help you out. And if I haven't if I haven't been like let's say we're going to work for IBM, and I've never worked for IBM in my life, I can't say to you, well, IBM would never be interested in you, you know, for the simple fact that I've never worked there. I don't know what IBM will be interested in. And you know, you've seen on many occasions like you know. IBM could be looking for many different things. It's not one specific thing they're looking for. So does it, I mean, it bothers you when people tell tell you or any of your friends or, or other wrestlers that you may know that, hey, you can't do this. You can't work for this promotion. You can't do this because of your look or because of your size. That was the gist of it, right? Absolutely, yes. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a thing where I was bragging or being boastful. It was a thing saying, it was basically saying, like, 
you know, if you're not if you're not on that level and you don't work there and you don't set the criteria, you shouldn't tell other guys who are obviously talented because they've been to other places that there's no chance for them to go there. You know, like the same thing was said about Kenny Omega and you know, he had a, a developmental deal for a while as well. So, you know, my thing is just, you know, there are a lot of guys in the business who obviously shouldn't be. You shouldn't waste your time, you know, trying to bring down people who obviously should be there or who or who have talent. You know, you should be doing your best to encourage them and, you know, help them out any way possible. Now, you spent the vast majority of your wrestling career in Canada. Is that uh, something you're just comfortable with? Is that something you want to, you know, spend your career doing? Or do you look look to make it into a major company, whether it be Japan or Mexico or one of the, one of the American companies? You know, to be honest with you, like, the toughest thing about, like, Canada is probably being in Canada. Um, U.S. borders, like, obviously, it's illegal to sneak across and work. So, you know, for instance, when I worked for Lucha Libre USA, you know, they had to get me a green card and stuff like that. So location is really, like, a, a very a big detriment to Canadian wrestlers. Now, you know, I would love to go back to Japan or Mexico, but, you know, economy is bad. Like, um, as you guys know, Smash, the, the promotion I was working for in Japan, closed down. Mm-hmm. So, you know, things are things are just tough, and so sometimes it's tough to get back to where you want to be. But, you know, I'm not complaining because there's been, you know, there's a lot of good promotions here in Canada and, and you know, a lot of good wrestlers and stuff like that as well. So, um, but, yeah, I would love to, you know, head back to the States or, or, you know, Mexico or Japan for that matter. My memory serves me correctly. Didn't you work a little bit for the Kayentai Dojo? I did. I stayed there for five weeks. Uh, you know, I wrestled on some of their their home promotion shows in Chiba, Japan. I did their Tokyo Korku and Hull show. Um, you know, I also worked for, like, that trip. I did Smash. I did K-Dojo. I did Tenru Project. I was in a six-man against Tenru, and I also worked for the um, women's promotion, Ice Ribbon. Tell, tell the listeners, if you can, Mentalo, you know, a lot of people in today's wrestling generation, I guess, you know, back in my day, we knew all about Japanese wrestling. We could tell everyone who all the champions were, blah, blah, blah. That seemed to have become a lost art, I guess, in the mm-hmm. storytelling of wrestling. Tell everybody what it's like to actually perform in Japan and how different the audience is compared to the American and Canadian counterparts. You know what, to be honest with you, there's a huge misconception amongst North Americans who who may have seen a tape or two about what Japanese fans are like. Um, For instance, when I worked in K-Dojo, the fans were very much respectful, that kind of sit on your hands, give you the golf claps. But then at the end of the match, or starting to build towards the end, um, you know, they they got right into it. So it wasn't, people always had this misconception that they're just sitting there quiet, just kind of clap their hands and they're a golf crowd, but they weren't. Now, on the flip side of that, when I worked for Smash or um, Ice Ribbon, the fans were very much like North American, like a North American crowd. They were cheering all the time. It wasn't golf claps. They were going crazy. They were chanting things. So it was very, like, it was very much similar. It was sort of like, if you can compare, um, say, Smash or, or any of this kind of promotions to like maybe sort of like an ECW crowd or ECW, WWE kind of entertainment style fans. Do you think, Mentel, that it's changed just in the last decade maybe? Or is that something, do you really think it's a misconception or is it just they're starting to get more Americanized, I guess, for lack of a better word? over the last several decades where they're starting to turn around the way they react to the to the uh, action in the ring? Well, I think it's a couple factors. For instance, like, like you were saying, WWE is obviously sort of the leader, so as their popularity grows, you know, the fans kind of see how the fans in North America react. But also, too, like the traditional promotions, All Japan, New Japan, I think that as their product changes, their fans change as well. And, um, but also to the same extent, say when FMW was coming up in the nineties, those fans were, were very similar to ECW fans. So there's been a slight, you know, the slight progression, like you're talking about is there and traditional fans are sort of, uh, 
you know, they're becoming a little bit more receptive. I remember Leatherface used to tell me how all Japan fans would only watch all Japan and New Japan fans would only watch New Japan and, and so on and so forth. And they hated, you know, FMW and IWA. They call it garbage wrestling and, and such. Right. But I think you're starting to see more mixing and then, you know, also they're becoming more aware of the WWE product and New Japan is becoming more entertainment based, you know, with the pyro and the big show and stuff like that. So I think they're slowly starting to follow, you know, what's popular. Obviously in North America, they're sort of the, the trendsetter, I guess you could say. Right. Zane, can you hit up Mr. Montala for the next question? Yeah, um, you uh, had a match with uh, Kenny Omega that was considered uh, the uh, top match for uh, Premier Championship Wrestling for the year that you did that. Can you tell right. us a little about that, and can you tell us about uh, working with uh, Kenny Omega? Uh, that match was, I believe, 2000 either 2002 or three for premier championship wrestling. Um, it was a card that featured Eddie Guerrero in the main event against playboy Will Damon. And I believe hockey talk man versus Brutus beefcake. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Kenny Omega and I worked the opener and, you know, we just, it was, we, we had had matches before in the past and, uh, you know, we just went out there and had a, had a really good match for its time. Um, he's a phenomenal talent. He always pushes you to the limit. He's always on the, the cutting edge of what's new and, and trendy and wrestling. And, you know, I like, I could go on praising the guy for hours, to be honest with you. He, he's such a great talent and he's made such a name for himself. 